Hey folks, John here, Old Hickory Forge. Welcome back. If it's your first time here, welcome. So, what's going on today? I'm out here in the workshop and we're getting moving on a little bit of a redemption project. So, this was actually supposed to be for September's quarterly Patreon giveaway. That's something I do for uh, those who support me on Patreon. I'm supposed to do giveaways every quarter. I usually end up coming in late with them. Sometimes because I'm just booked too solid and sometimes because projects go sideways like this did. So what I got here, it's a bit hard to see on camera, but the middle, this was going to be a rounding hammer. This here middle part is a piece of a um, wrought iron anchor chain from a World War II battleship. So I was going to forge weld 1045 to the faces, make a hammer out of it. It was going to, it was going to be pretty awesome, but um, I fought with this thing again and again and again. The first time I attempted the forge welds, one side took beautifully, one side took for the most part, but there was one corner that was causing trouble. And so I'm like, okay, I'll, um, you know, I'll cut that side off, weld some new 1045 on and try again. So I did that. And uh, I just, I could not get the forge weld to take. Face welds like this are pretty difficult to pull off. So I'm like, okay, you know, I'll cut both sides off and try again. Because by that point, I had lost so much to scale that it just, um, it wasn't going to work. And by now, there's just not really enough of this left to make, you know, a sizable hammer. But what I think I can do to kind of salvage it and still make something cool out of it, I'm going to cut out this middle part to salvage this wrought iron. I'm going to forge it out into a bar. And we're going to make a wrought iron sand by. So if you want to check it out, stick around. First things first, we're getting the 1045 cut off of the faces, so then we'll take that center part and start drawing it out into a bar and see how much we can get. We might only have enough for some kind of small knife, but I still think it'll be cool. So, I actually didn't have room to cut both ends off on the bandsaw, which was something I didn't think about, but I really should have. With how terrible this forge weld did, this is undoubtedly going to fall apart as I start forging it out. So we're just going to heat this guy up, start pressing it out into a bar, and then cut this off with a hot cut or something like that. If you're unfamiliar with the sand my technique, it's pretty simple. Basically, it means three layers, so usually what happens is you'll forge weld a hardenable steel core between two layers of softer material, like mild steel, wrought iron. But you can also use it um, using Damascus or stuff like that for your jacket to make really, really cool blades and everything. Funny story, if you actually watched my Forged and Fire episode, Season 6, Episode 17, this is the technique we had to use for the blades in Round 1 and 2, so kind of cool. So I'm finally getting another chance to work on this. Uh, we got our wrought iron cut up, cleaned up. We got our 1084 core cut up, clean on both sides. So we got good welding surfaces. Got a little work peg for holding it with a pair of tongs. We'll get all this tacked together with the welder, forge weld it together and make a blade. So, I've taken two welding passes under the power hammer now. That little bit of overhang was already there, so I'm not too worried about that. We're going to grind all that off nice and smooth, so we don't have to worry about forging any cold shuts as we forge it down. You know, you've seen me forge weld a million times. It's pretty simple. You're basically just trying to get your billet to about 23, 2400 degrees. Make sure it's nice and hot all the way through. A pair of dark eye pro can uh, be useful for looking into the forge and discerning what's going on because it's so bright. But basically, you're kind of looking for the surface of your steel to start sweating, if that makes sense. But uh, that billet should be good and solid. We'll hit the grinder and uh, get back in the forge and bring it up and do a bar stock. So, the seams are ground off. It's pretty cool to see the differences in uh, the oxidation of the 1084 and the wrought iron. Pretty neat, but uh, it's looking solid, so we'll go ahead and throw this guy back under the power hammer and bring it out and do about a quarter-inch bar stock or so. 
I'm hoping to get enough material to be able to just go stock removal for the knife project. So here's what we got out of the billet. We got about 12 inches of usable material. It's about inch and three quarter wide or so, about a quarter inch thick. So we should have enough to just go stock removal from here. I'm not looking to make a huge knife. Um, we may or may not end up having to do some forging on the bevels to make it a little wider. I'm hoping not because the biggest challenge that I've run into with Sanmai is keeping the core centered and I really have yet to produce one that I'm 100% happy with. So I did my best to work from both sides and keep everything even. I'm going stock removal from here instead of forging out the point and forging the bevels and the ricasso and the tang and all that is going to kind of help us keep that core centered. I hope we'll see how it goes. So our billet's nice and cool. I've kind of got it set up against the handle material that I want to use. Whenever you're using natural material like bone or antler or something, you kind of have to design the rest of the knife around it for the lines to flow, if that makes sense. So I got a rough profile drawing out that I think is going to look good. I think I kind of want... A little bit more curved to the clip point up here than I normally do on uh, my standard style of Bowie knives. This is actually one I made for myself. It's 500 layer Damascus. Pretty sweet, but it's going to be pretty similar in terms of overall shape. I want an S guard, and I think I'm going to try to do a wrought iron screw on pommel at the end and have threads on the inside of the tang. I've never done a curved threaded tang before, so we'll see how it works out, but uh, let's profile this guy. Come to think of it, this is actually my first time really using antler as a handle material as well. Uh, I've done small antler handled knives like hook knives and carving knives and things like that where I've been able to just kind of drill a hole in the end and set a small tang into it. This is my first attempt at like a real handle made of antler. So wish me luck. So we have the blade shape roughed out on the sander. The shoulders aren't square or anything yet. The next thing I'm going to do is go ahead and stamp my touch mark here on the Ricasso. Because if I squared up the shoulders perfectly using the file guide and everything and then stamp my mark, it might screw them up. After that, I'm going to go ahead and heat treat the blade. Because one thing I've learned doing, you know, hidden tang buoys like this is you want the blade to be pretty much completely, completely to its finished thickness before you fit up your guard. Because if I fit it up now... After I take this up the grits and hand sand it and polish it out, it's going to be ever, ever so slightly thinner. It can make, you know, a good looking fit up, a not so good looking fit up. And, you know, you're, you're never really going to get absolute perfection. At least I don't think I will, but I want to make it look as good as I can. But that's what's happening now. Alrighty, so... We got the shoulders done, we had clamped this guy up in the file guide, made sure it was square to the spine, and then we went in with a round file into that corner so we don't have a hard 90 right there. Went in with a flat file, dressed everything up. So this guy's ready for heat treating right now. I went ahead and normalized it three times after we put our mark in and made sure it's good and straight and everything. So let's, uh, let's quench this puppy. Alrighty, so we got this guy out of the temper. I did 400 for two hours. Uh, once I get down to core steel on the grinding, I'll take the Rockwell files to it, and if it's too hard, I'll give it another cycle. But for the grinding, we got our 36 grit, 120 grit, and then an A65 and 45 Trizact, I believe, which are equivalent to 320 and 400, respectively. So that's what we'll use to grind the blade, and that'll set us up real nice for hand sanding. So this is after the Trizac belts. I like to turn those down to about half speed or so. You know, they're really nice for getting those deep gouges from the lower grits out. So come time to hand sand this, we won't have any big gouges to dig out, hopefully. Something I'm asked a lot about is kind of just how to grind a blade. And uh, I really don't think I have 
the eloquence or knowledge or teaching capability to explain it to you in proper terms. So I'll leave a link down below to a Green Beetle video where he goes into very, very great detail and explains it in an easy to understand manner. But I will kind of talk you through how it is I do it. Anyway, I like to do the flats first so you can see I've taken the whole blade up the grits all the way. I didn't forge the bevels so the whole thing is just flat right now. So next thing we're going to start going after this edge. So the first thing I've done to kind of get my bevel started is come at it at a much, much steeper angle than the finished piece is going to be and kind of bring the edge down pretty close to its finished thickness. You know, nothing has to be perfect right now. We have a lot of time to fix things as we go up the grits and slowly push the grind back, but that's the next step. It's called pushing the grind back. And I'll talk to you about that real quick before we actually do it. So like I said, we were coming out the grinder at a pretty steep angle. So what I'll do now is I'll just ever so slightly reduce that just by like a couple of degrees at a time. And what's going to happen is that line that you see on the blade that is our primary bevel is going to slowly, slowly move up the blade. And now it's kind of time to start thinking about where you want it to end up and where your plunge lines need to be and all that. Uh, I don't want to damage my touch marks, so I am actually going to start angling the blade a little bit to try to put my plunge line up here, if that makes sense. To kind of show you what it is we're going after, this is the side we haven't pushed the grind back on yet, and this is the side we have pushed the grind back on. You see how much higher it comes up the blade. Don't worry too much about making your lines straight and perfect right now. We'll have plenty of time to fix that as we take it up the grids, and ultimately hand sanding will fix a lot of imperfections. Your goal is really just to hog out all that material and avoid damaging your flats as much as possible. You can see I got a little bit carried away right there, but that's no problem at all. But anyway, that's kind of the gist of it. So here's what we got off of the 2x72. I'm pretty happy with it. As you can see, the lines aren't perfect, but they really don't need to be. We can fix all that in hand sanding. And the longer you spend chasing perfect lines on the grinder, the more likely you are to make a mistake that might force you to have to rethink your whole geometry and everything. So I like to kind of just quit while I'm ahead. You know, you shouldn't expect perfect lines unless you're someone like Dennis Tyrell or Kyle Royer or something like that. But uh, next thing I want to do, I want to go ahead and do a quick test etch to uh, just make sure we got our core steel exposed and kind of see what we're looking at. Oh, it's also worth mentioning they actually do make beveling jigs. So, um, you know, I grind all my blades freehand. I've never used one, but if you want clean, repeatable, close to perfect lines, and if I was doing a big run of stock removal production knives, that's probably what I would use. So, uh, you know, use one, don't use one, it's up to you. So just a quick test etch, about 10 seconds or so in the acid. That ain't bad. I'm really pretty happy with how much core steel we've got exposed. That looks, uh, that looks pretty nice, I think. So now it's time to start thinking about how it is we're going to go after the handle. I want to do a bolt through construction. I'm going to make an S guard as well as a butt plate out of wrought iron, uh, some other wrought iron I've got laying around. Biggest challenge I think is going to be matching the curve of the antler. I probably should have actually done this before we heat treated the blade, but because we only really need the bend back in here, I'm pretty confident we can do it without damaging the heat treat of the blade. So I'm just going to use my usual, you know, method of attaching the bolt. I'm going to drill a hole, cut out a slot, Nice big weld, and then uh, we'll go from there. Also, as you can see, for securing my butt plate, rather than making a coupler nut out of a piece of half inch round and drilling and tapping it and trying to keep everything straight and centered, I just bought a coupler nut. I don't know why I didn't think of that sooner. But anyway, let's get moving. Really important thing to remember if you're gonna try to use this method of attaching threads to your tang is to keep in mind the thickness of the top of your tang. It's usually not a problem on bigger knives, but on one this kind of small, the spine and the tang are a little thinner. I don't know if you can tell or not, but the threads are actually just ever so slightly thicker than the thickest part of our tang. So before we actually weld the threads on and bend the handle and everything, we need to make and fit the guard. To make the fittings for the blade, I want to use wrought iron as well. So I've got a piece that's about one inch round or so. I've used this wrought before. It's real pretty stuff. Basically, we're just going to flatten this out onto a bar stock. Hopefully, it'll be wide enough to make the butt cap as well. But we'll get the guard made. The guard and blade need to be completely, completely finished before we put the threads on and bend it and fit the handle up and everything, so that's what's happening now. Now 
Alrighty, we got the rough shape of our guard ground in, so now it's time to do everyone's favorite thing and drill and file this guy. So, you know the drill. We've got as many holes drilled as we can, and now we're just going to go in here with needle files and carve out a slot for the tang. If you had a mill, this would be a good time to use it. But wrought iron is, you know, some pretty soft, easy to file stuff, so hopefully this doesn't take all day. Alrighty, so we're pretty close, so the next thing I'm going to do is go ahead and bend the guard to its final shape. And then we'll sculpt out the guard, uh, polish it out a little bit, go ahead and file our tang slot the rest of the way. And then we can get to work hand sanding the blade. You know, like I said before, the blade and the guard need to be pretty much completely done before we put the threads on. Because once we do, we're not going to be able to put this guard on if it's not already there. So uh, that's what's happening now. So we got the guard fit up, you know, as usual, my fit ups are far from perfect. Uh, the good thing about doing the screw on pommel construction that I'm doing is even if your guard fit up isn't perfect, there's no way it's ever going to loosen up or come off or anything, but I would like to get much better at that. I feel like that's kind of my weakest point is uh, doing guards and fittings and things like that. I really need to make or buy one of those little jacks for press fitting the guards as you go. You get a much cleaner fit up with those, but that's serviceable. So. Now we get to do every bladesmith's favorite thing and hand sand this bad boy. So we got the first side sanded up to 80 grit and that actually didn't take very long at all. You know, normally the first grit coming off the sander is the worst one. But between the wrought iron being so soft and us, uh, the Trizac belt smoothing up the surface so well, that really wasn't that painful. So we'll do... 120, 220, 320, 600, and that'll be as far as we'll go. Kind of cool, you can already start to see the contrast between the wrought iron and the 1084 coming out. Pretty cool. We got the threads welded on. We got the tank bent to where it matches the curve of the antler. So now it's time to start hollowing this guy out more or less. From the top side, we're going to drill and birch just like we would, you know, a normal piece of handle material. And then from the back end, we're going to come in here with a bigger drill bit and try to make all that space line up to make room for our coupler nut, which is going to be welded onto this piece of wrought iron, which will screw on to make the butt cap. So uh, you're starting to see how it'll come together. Ooh, man, that stinks. Just going through trying to broach out the slot for the tang. I've already drilled in from the back side. I got plenty of room for my coupler nut. Uh, this stuff's actually pretty nice to work with because the pith is so much softer than the, uh, the outer part of the antler. Like, you really know whenever you're hitting the sides when you're trying to drill. And it hollows out pretty easily. I tell you, it really does stink when you drill it, though. All right, so we got our antler fitted up. It's looking pretty good. We had to hollow it out quite a bit to make room for uh, the curve of the tang to pass through, but our threads are in there. A little bit off center, but uh, that's okay. That'll kind of, we got plenty of material to play with and room to play with and everything. So we'll get our coupler nut welded onto our piece of wrought iron, uh, do our first assembly, trim this up, and then we'll take it up the grits, polish it out, get everything ready for etching and assembly. So we got our coupler nut welded up. We're doing the first kind of test fit of the piece that's going to become the butt cap. And as you can see, it's not sitting flat. I was pretty sure that was going to happen. Whenever you're doing a fit up like this, the chances of you getting it right on the first try are pretty slim. So what we got to do is just go through and knock off that corner on the left and try to flatten everything out and then uh, sand it a little bit and check, sand it a little bit and check until everything's nice and flush. So just after some minor tweaking, it's looking pretty good. Um, so I've gone ahead and just roughly marked out kind of where I need to trim it down to. I'm trying to avoid doing any sanding on the antler, if at all possible. So I'm, uh, I'm going to try to trim this down little by little by hand off of the knife and then just, uh, you know, screw it on and check, screw it on and check until I've got a fit up that I'm happy with.
So here's our mock assembly. Uh, next step is to get all the pieces ready for the acid etching and the epoxy, put in the handle and everything. The pommel isn't sitting quite where it's going to be right now. That happens when you do this style of construction sometimes. You know, when the piece is really long, you've got a really good purchase to screw it on really tight. And then when you don't have that, you can't. So, uh, but that's all right. Once the epoxy's in there, we'll have a little bit of lubrication that'll help us get that last eighth of a turn or so. And it should come out looking pretty nice. So next thing, we're going to go ahead and get those scratches that clamping this thing to the welding table put in there out. And I will etch these pieces. We got all our pieces in the ferric chloride, our knife, and the guard is attached to this here C-clamp. And then I got the pommel or butt cap, whichever you want to call it. Uh, I put a screw in the end and then put it on this little piece of tie wire. We'll give that about 10 minutes and see what we're looking at. So after 10 minutes in the acid, the etch on the blade looks great. I'm very, very happy with that. But the guard is still kind of muddy. So what I've done, I've just kind of let it hang down on the threads. And I'm just going to try to submerge the guard and... Uh, you know, etch it for another 10 minutes or so and see what we're dealing with. So, here it is all done. Got a nice good edge on her. She's good and sharp. Very, very comfortable handle, actually. You know, uh, I've always kind of been hesitant to really go for using antler as a handle material because if you buy it online, you don't really know what you're getting. All the antler I have on hand now, I bought at Blade Show last year, and it was pieces that I picked up and felt and made sure they were going to make a good handle. So that's pretty sweet. Uh, another thing that's pretty cool is the wrought iron that I made the jacket of the Sandmai from actually came from the aircraft carrier, the USS Essex. At least that's what I was told. Uh, the gentleman I got it from, Al Shipley, told me the guy he got it from said that's where he got it, so I have no way to prove or disprove that. But uh, he did tell me and show me that the links that he uses for his wrought iron are marked USN, which means U.S. Navy. And the U.S. Navy actually switched from wrought iron chain to, uh, you know, more cast iron chain and whatnot in, like, 1920 or 21, something like that. So uh, the iron in this blade is over 100 years old, as well as the fittings for the guard and the pommel. These are old tie rods from a train car that a buddy of mine, you know, was taking apart that are from 1901. So all the metal bits of this knife are over 100 years old, and it's really, really cool to see them repurposed into something really awesome like this. The way the texture and the grain of the wrought iron flows with the texture of the antler is really, really cool. All in all, it's a beautiful piece that I'm really, really happy with, and I almost wish I could keep it, but I owe patrons a giveaway, so let's get that taken care of. Full disclosure, one thing that does kind of suck about working with wrought iron is that it's very, very difficult to keep from rusting, at least here where I live. It's very humid. I live in the mountains, you know, right next to a creek and all that. So even in still air with a coating of oil and everything, this stuff will rust very, very quickly. So I'm going to clean it up and oil it as best I can before I send it out. But, uh, you know, just be advised, whoever wins this knife, by the time it gets to you, it's probably going to be rusty. So uh, just go at it with, like, some WD-40 rust remover or something like that in a soft cloth. Uh, don't use anything super abrasive that could damage the finish. And if you live somewhere in a really dry climate, it might not be a problem for you. Uh, my good buddy Spencer Sadison of Heavy Forge up in Alaska, he does a lot of wrought iron sand mine. He says he never has this problem because of how dry the air is there. But anyway, let's pick us a winner. Alrighty, so you know the drill. Patreon supporters, all your names are on our trusty wheelandnames.com. Let's click to spin. Come on, spin. There we go. Justin Montefort. So, Justin, if you want the knife, she's yours. I'll shoot you an email letting you know you won. Uh, and then just get me your shipping info and we'll get this little baby sent out to you. You know, I hope it leads along useful, productive life. It's pretty cool that we were able to take that failed hammer project and make something so awesome out of it. I'm glad I was able to make use of such a rare and unique piece of material. But anyway, if you like what you saw, like, share, subscribe, all that jazz. Always more cool stuff coming. I hope you liked the video. I hope you learned something. Patreon supporters, thank you so much for your support. I know I'm behind on giveaways, but uh, the next one's already in the works, and then we should be on track for the March giveaway on time. Probably. But uh, like I said, like, share, subscribe, all that jazz. If you want to follow my social media, link in the description. Instagram is where I'm the most active, as well as my Etsy if you'd like to purchase any of my work. And Patreon if you'd like to become a supporter and get in on the uh, 
the supposed to be quarterly giveaways, but that's all I got for you. I know. Y'all take care.